I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. Classroom etiquette says that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. <laughs> you can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sins. It could be in mental attitude sin. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. They must be confessed in silence and privacy through your priesthood prior to Bible study so that 1 John 1, 9 can apply to your life if we confess our sin or sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, that, that's, that work is for the work of sanctification, not salvation. And that puts you back into fellowship with the Father through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now is able to teach you the truth of the Word of God. And this applies to those who are with us by the Internet. I, I, I request that of you, too. Classroom etiquette is important if you're going to set in on our study. I consider you to be just as evident as you would be if you were sitting here. I expect the same thing from you. So, Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way to study with us by the automobile and by the Internet. And we do pray that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of our life because we desire it. We've confessed our sin. It shows that we're positive to the truth of the word of God. And we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. I can only teach it. I can't make people believe it. But the Holy Spirit can. He can show them things within their own spirit that they could grasp and understand that I wouldn't have a clue about. And I'm thankful for that, Father. I'm I need all the help I can get in teaching, and I am thankful to have that. So we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to take a look at these zones through the life of, Re of Isaac and uh, uh, Rebecca, uh, their, their marriage. Uh, I'm going to cover five things about these five zones in a moment because they're going to, th these are going to be zones of conflict. And you got to know how to deal with them. Each one of these zones are going to have their own built-in conflicts. You know, you get married and, and uh, you came from a single life and now you got to live as a couple life. And then you get kids and then you got to, you got to live as a couple and live as a family. And, and then it just goes on and on and on. And so what we want to do now, <clears throat> let me start by telling you that the, this, you know, this is one of the great famous love stories in the Bible is Isaac and Rebecca. And uh, you need to write this. I think it's on your paper. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. This is important because if you're going to get married. If you're a believer and you want to get married, you got to believe you got to marry a believer. Believers marry believers. And I put that down there. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, 9, 5, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 16. It all tells you that you're supposed to marry a believer. That's, that's strong. That's new covenant teaching as well as old, old covenant teaching. Believers married believers. Isaiah and Rebecca were believers. They got married. That's the beginning. That's the foundation of, of, of a, a, not only is that a foundation of your life, it's the foundation of your marriage, your family, and everything else. And so... You need, need to be sure that you marry a believer. If, you, if you've not been married, make sure you marry a believer. Now, here's point number one. The book of Genesis shows the struggle in the lives of the patriarch family. From Genesis 12 on, you're in the patriarch period. From Genesis 12 to the end of the book, it is all about the patriarch family. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob make up the patriarch family. And when you study this, that, you know, from Genesis 12 through 50, but when you study this, you understand that all of the members of the patriarch family struggled, not in their marriage, they married all right. They struggled when they got the children. For example, it started out, they struggled with all three of the patriarch wives were barren. It, they, that's that's the first struggle they had in it, and and a, a lot of bad choices were made in that. Even with Abraham, <clears throat> and so, I mean, 
they struggle with barrenness and and because of that they struggle with messianic prophecy see the promise was given to Abraham and was passed on to Isaac and passed on to Jacob that they were the heirs of the messianic seed. Now, when you go to Matthew, the first chapter, and you study the genealogy of the life of Christ, the ancestral life, you see that that was a messianic seed. Now, that came from Genesis 3.15. That's the, where the seed prophecy was given, right there in Genesis 3.15, uh, after the fall of Adam. And so all three, all three of these wives of the patriarchs, here's God. God says, you guys are going to be the heir bearers of the Messiah. Sarah struggles with it. Rebecca struggles with it. Uh, Rachel, all, all, of these, all of these women are going to struggle with it. And so it's interesting how, that, how they all struggled with, not only did they struggle with barrenness, but they struggled with, with God about it. Right? I mean, you've studied these stories. If you haven't, it's well worth your time. They all struggled with it. And listen, when, when you struggle with your life and the word of God connected with it, you are, you are in the angelic conflict. I mean, ding, ding. And the only way that you can beat that is with the word of God. Matthew, the fourth chapter, when Jesus got in that business, fighting with the devil, remember, he takes him to the mountain, remember, and he fights him in that deal? Yep. You know how he beats him? With the word of God. With the word of God. And so you, you need to know this. I mean, you can't, there's no way you can figure your way out of the box. So... This is important, and, and you can see it in the lives of these people. The Patriarch Period is a wonderful study on, on family marriage, and that's where I discovered these zones of preparation in your life. Apparently, God chose to expose, which is kind of interesting to me, when I study the life of these guys, you, I, it becomes apparent that God chose to expose some struggles in their, in their walk with him as, 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 as to show us about ours. I mean, they're not going to struggle. They're going to struggle in a lot of the same ways we struggle. Conflict in our life. Where's God? What's he doing? How do I engage God in this that he can fight my fight? The battle is the Lord's. You know, it sounds good. It wears kind of tough sometimes. And when you study the life of these people, you, you can see their struggle in their walk with God. And the fact that, that God has selected these men to show God's faithfulness in their life so that we could gather information from it. I mean, that's why it's in the Bible. You know? <laughs> I mean, he really, he gets down and shows their core stuff to other people. I mean, like us. We're all sitting around going, like, oh, wow. Um, so, and and then what he does is it... In these episodes, God shows that God is faithful to his word. You take that word in, he will bring it out. You take it in, he brings it out. And he brings it out, and that's called the walk of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Once you've heard it and learned it, then you got to live it. That's called walking by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So this is important. And, and, um. And why, why do we go through these struggles and why do we seek God and why do we do these things? Listen, the whole deal is to get us back. Listen, without God, you would struggle and just die in there. He's able to get you back on your feet. We're to run the, the race to the finish, right? You know, fight the good fight. Keep the, you know, stay in the race. Uh, keep the faith. You remember that second Timothy four. So, I mean, listen, you live in the devil's world, John 10, 31. You live in the devil's world. The Satan is the God of this world. Now, when you get saved, then you find out that God is greater than this world. God is your daddy. I mean, how important is that? He's not just some guy up there with a big stick running the whole thing. I mean, he's your, once you get saved, now, he's your creator God until then. But after that, he's your daddy. You know that Romans 8, 15 through 17? 
That's what that says. He's your daddy. He's adopted you through Christ. Listen to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And this is why I think all of this is important. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, I'm sure that Isaac and Rebecca didn't, didn't know when they were going through all this that there was a la- large crowd of witnesses surrounding them. But God exposed it. He let us, you know, he had the camera inside the life, and we got all to see it. We got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. In other words, God let us see what he sees all the time in our life. Aren't you glad that he don't open the camera on us? Man, I'm like, oh, oh. if that's what requires to get in the hall of the hall of fame called faith, keep me out. But but it isn't. Therefore, since we have a great cloud of witness surrounding us, and there there is around us as well. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which does so easily entangle us. You will see that that sin that. There's a sin in your life that can easily entangle you. You're going to see it in Isaac and Rebecca. If you pay any attention in your own life, you can see it in you. Let us run with endurance the race. Watch this. Let us run with endurance the race that sets before us. You know who sets that race? God does. You know what your job is to do? Run it. And how long do I run it? Till it's finished. <laughs> you don't have to win it, but you do have to finish it. How am I going to do it? Keep the faith. It's not simple. It, 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 I suppose it, I should say it's not complex. It's simple. But when you're living it, it's complex. It's not simple. What makes all of your struggles in life simple is the word of God. Just keep the faith. See, because the faith puts the responsibility on God to be faithful to his word. And how good is that? Our job is to walk by faith. His job is to do what the faith is required of him. And you're going to see that lived out in this. Then he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You know how the word perfecter is the word completer. He's the one who completes your faith. You know, faith comes by hearing. It's got to be believed. Then it's applied. You know, the faith cycle, then it's applied. (coughs) And listen, and then it's completed. Now, we talk about the faith cycle all the time. It goes from hearing to believing to applying to uh, completing. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is your things hoped for. That's that side. Hope for the conviction of things not seen. That's that side. This is where the promises are taken and applied. You hear it and apply it. And over here is where the performance of that promise comes. Performance is on this side. You apply it, and God brings it to completion. That's a faith cycle. And that's how this thing works. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, Romans ten seventeen. That faith that you heard has to be understood and believed. That's Hebrews 4, 2. Then it comes to time of application. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Here's where the problem really arises, right here. Because sometimes this requires us waiting and trusting. Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 21, that God is faithful. He will do what he's promised. And that's really important. And listen, this whole thing starts, Christ is, listen, right here, when it says, I'm going to read it again so, so you can grab it. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or completer of our faith. He's the one that he, this is the whole, this is the whole ball game of the Christian life. This is, this is the walking by faith. This is the hearing. This is the, over here is the learning side. This is the learning side. And this is the living side of the word of God. Boy, if you don't learn this, you are really going to struggle in the Christian life. And when you learn this, the struggle won't be in the Christian life. Won't be in the Christian life. (laughs) 
Just thought I'd tell you. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for, listen to me, here's why. He's talking about Jesus. Who for the joy set before him. Now, we have a race set before, look at, let us run with endurance the race, what? Set before us. Here, Jesus is our example, who for the joy, what? Set before him, endured, that's, that's that endurance of running the race to the finish. That's why he is your great coach on that subject, right? He's the author and the completer or perfecter of your what? Your faith. Keep the faith. See how important classroom is? There's a classroom in learning, and there's a classroom in living. We know it. The world talks about it. Uh, the, hard, the, the, pro, the program of hard knocks, right? The world even understands this. You can, my grandfather used to tell me all the time, you can learn the easy way or the hard way. Look, it's up to you which way you want to learn it. And he's just talking about common sense stuff. <clears throat> when talking about real struggles. Here's number, number two. We will list the five general zones of marital conflict. That's conflict that's going to come to this zone. Conflict that's going to come to this zone. And you got to be prepared for it. Not necessary conflict you're going to create in the zone. But if you don't know how to handle the conflict that comes to the zone, it'll create more conflict. <laughs> then you go to the doctor and he'll give you all kinds of mind expanding ideas and drugs. And that will help you. It will numb and numb you through it. You don't need to do that. But you do need to know how to deal with it. Remember that each zone years work by a sliding rule. Remember that. Now, I listed just definite times, but remember there's a sliding rule of importance to them. The first year, notice the one thing that all these zones have in common is adjusting. See the word adjust? Okay. They all require adjusting. Okay. And it's that's where a lot of the conflict comes, but each zone has its own conflict. Okay. Listen, the devil can cause more havoc getting inside a marriage for the work of God. He can cause more havoc to the work of God when he can get inside a marriage. How do I know it? Adam and Eve. I mean, that's a classic example. That's, that's the primo one because they didn't have a sin nature, right? They didn't have a sin nature. And they were in a perfect environment. Everything was hunky-dory. Whoever hunky-dory is, it was hunky-dory. <clears throat> we don't have that. We don't have that. So the first year of marriage, that first year of marriage is adjusting from a single life to a couple life. There can be a lot of conflict in that. Listen, it, it has its own built-in stuff. You've got to know that there's got, this is a period of adjusting, and you've got to learn, give and take and adjust, and see what the Bible has to say about getting married. <laughs> and the Bible has a great deal to say about getting married. Listen, if you think that comes natural, that everything just flows, that's called romance. That's not called marriage. Everything is perfect in romance because everybody ignores the struggles. Everybody ignores all the problems. You know, the, the, um, someone said that uh, the, the moonlight and the roses turn to daylight and dishes. Rea that's reality. <clears throat> so there is adjusting, and the Word of God will help you with that, being spiritual. You can be believers and get married. Your first year can be... Listen, I've known people that come back from the honeymoon and said it was hell. And how can, I mean, a honeymoon can be hell? What has gone on there? So there's adjusting. You got to move from single to a, a, a couple. 
Then the third one, the, the second zone is the third year of marriage. Remember the sliding rule. And usually by the third year, what you're adjusting is from being a couple to being a family. It's a big deal. You know, you can't, I, I, I try to tell young couples to get married, you know, get yourself settled down. Don't have kids until you're in the third, fourth, fifth year in there. Have kids. Then have your kids. And you have no idea how they're going to change your life. You have no idea. Oh, I, I know. I, I was raised in a family. I'm not talking about being raised in one. That's so easy. Well, I, it wasn't easy where I was. Ah, it's easy compared to where you're going. So you got there is an enormous adjustment from being a couple to being a family. Being a couple to be a family. Now you got kids. And the Bible has a great deal to say about that. Then zone three is 16 years of marriage. Remember a sliding rule. Doesn't always have to be. But somewhere in there, it's a, it's a uh, wait, zone three, 16th year, is adjusting to children's activity and, and, and juggling careers. This is a period where your, the couple part of you can get lost, can get lost very easy. Doing all good things. And I'm going to tell you, in this zone, a lot of marriages really get in trouble. I tell couples when they hit this zone, remember a sliding rule, and they get so busy running kids here and running kids there and this and that and this and that, and he's into a career mode and he's moving really fast in his career, and they don't have, they listen, they don't have time to meet even. I mean, they have five or ten minutes at night when they lay down, and then they're too tired to really talk or do anything about it. We'll, let's talk in the morning, and then the clock goes off, and they sleep a little extra, and then they're off to a run again. I tell people when they hit this zone, they need, they need to be sure they have date nights. They need to be sure that they can go off at some points of their time alone together as a couple and work on it. This is probably a good period in this period, somewhere in that up to 20 years of your marriage to go, go have a second honeymoon because you need that fire brought back in. This is a place where this is because this is like you're about ready to go into the second half and boy, you better have a game plan. And this is where a lot of marriages roll over and die. Zone four it's 25 years of marriage. They have difficulty adjusting to an empty nest and then their kids getting married and got weddings and all that stuff. Um, and then guys are starting to think about and, and gals are starting to think about retirement and some of those ideas. They've still got 10 years left or something <laughs> like that. But now they're thinking that. We're in the beginning, they thought about how they could get where they're going now they've gotten where they're going, and now they're thinking about how do I get out of this and how do I survive the next 20 years uh, of my life uh, based on these things. And so that, and listen, the Bible has a great deal to say to you about it. And then the final zone, the fifth zone, is the 45th year of marriage sliding rule, adjusting to aging parents. Your, your aging parents th th absorbs a lot of time, doesn't it? Oh, gosh. Then your retirement. How are you going to adjust to that? A lot of women go, like their husband has never been home. Now he's home all the time. It drives him nuts. I remember my uncle, when he retired, I remember so well because it was every time we got together as family, it was like, oh, please, can somebody come and take Max and go do something with him? <laughs> he was driving his wife because he had painted everything that could be painted about the third time. And he was... You know, he was just bored to death and had nothing to do. And so we all took times taking him someplace, <laughs> doing something with him. Oh, this is crazy. Because he had no plans. He had no idea of what he should do. He's still a high productive person. What am I going to do with my life? I mean, I can only wash the car so many times. I can only do so. What, and, and so they just bored to death. Um, so, listen, this ought to be a time, though, listen, this ought to be a time for growing together 
growing together in the aging process in your love. This ought to be a time of growing old together, you know, growing old together. You know, my very best friend in the whole world is my wife. I mean that. My very best friend. If I wanted to go anywhere with anybody, that's who I'd want to go with. That's who I, I'd want to go with anywhere on a trip. That's who I'd want to go to the beach with. That's who I'd want to be with because I have so much fun with her. She still laughs at all my corny jokes. I mean, uh, seriously, I can tell the difference. And she's just a joy to be with and to talk with. And we do puzzles together and we just enjoy ourselves. I never get bored. I'm easily bored. <laughs> I never get bored. And I used to, my, I watched my grandfather and my grandmother grow old together in love. And it impressed my life out of the wazoo. I don't know what the wazoo is, but. Probably is not good. Okay. So what you want to do going through these zones is, and listen, you may, listen, you might have not, you listen, you may have gotten married and are now in zone four in your mate's life. <laughs> think about that. I mean, think about the fact that she's got kids that are grown and have grandkids and maybe great grandkids. And you've been brought into that. You haven't grown into that. You've been brought into it. And I get a lot of questions about this stuff. So what you want to look for is red flags. You want to look for red flags. The red flags go up when there's conflict and, and you can't get resolved. And everybody goes to their separate corners and shadow boxes. <laughs> Try to get rid of their anger. There's a better solution for that. It's essential to pass through these zones when the red flags goes up, here's what's important. You got to know how to walk in the spirit. And boy, you better walk in the spirit, not the flesh. And you better walk by faith, and not faith, but not by sight. If you walk in the flesh and you walk by sight, your marriage is in deep, deep trouble. And it could be at a point where it'll never be recovered. You will never grow old together in love. If you don't play, if you don't, if you don't do this right. So I, I encourage you that. I put scripture down there for you, like Galatians 5, 16, 17, walk in the spirit, not the flesh. Second Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith, not by sight. Always prepare for the next marital zone coming, coming by, it's coming by testing. That's for sure. It's coming and it's going to be a test in your life. The next zone's coming. There ain't nothing you can do about it. The zone's here. Listen, it's coming. <laughs> It's coming just like the clock, you know, 10 o'clock, then, well, 11 o'clock's coming, 12 o'clock. You ever set up at night? You can't go back to sleep. 12 o'clock's coming, 1 o'clock's coming, 2 o'clock's coming. Oh, boy. Here's point three. I want to show you this. Isaac and Rebecca did very well with zone one. They did really well with zone one. When you study their life, uh, they did really well in zone one. Uh, you, that's... You can study in there like Genesis 24 through 27, something like that. They did really well. But listen to me. They stayed in zone one. Listen to me now. They stayed in zone one 20 years. Zone one lasted for 20 years because Rebecca was barren. This shows the importance of the slide rule in these zones. This was an unusual and trying time for both of them regarding the messianic promise of the seed to the patriarchs. Like in Matthew 1, 2, Luke 3, 34 reminds us that God did complete that task in their life. But they struggled with it. Much of their struggle was self-induced misery by failure to apply the faith cycle to their life. In other words, applying the truth of, of the word of God to their zone. We saw Abraham and Sarah struggle with it, didn't we? And Abraham in that zone. But listen, I put this in bold print because I'm going to tell you the absolute truth. You got to get it. You can recover at any zone 
no matter how much conflict and stress, by applying the truth of the word of God to it. The only one who will recover it. I don't care what you're going through. I mean, I've had couples come in, and they were like, I mean, it was like packing pistols, pistols, you know what I, here's where our conflict has taken us. And the truth of the matter is there is nothing impossible for God. There is nothing. And buddy, I have seen, I, I've counseled through some really tough stuff and I went, whew. But they're going to take every bit of God because you're you're dead in the water. And it don't matter how big a fish has swallowed you. God can get you out of it. Right, Jonah? Yeah. Be sure that when you get in conflict, you don't resolve it spiritually because if you don't, it becomes self-induced misery. It just builds it. It magnifies your problem. You're the one that makes a mountain out of a molehill. Can I tell you again, there is, listen, God, nothing with God, nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible to those who believe. And that's the absolute truth. This was a special time of testing because when they got married, Isaac was 40. In, in Genesis 25, 20. Remember, the spiritual testing is a good thing. Spiritual testing is a good thing. Quit, quit belly aching about it. It's a good thing. Romans eight twenty eight says it's a good thing. You have changed your attitude about it. It'll never be a good thing. God will never do the impossible because you're not you're not a player in it. You got stuck on it's impossible. That's because you're walking by sight, not by faith. Listen, you need to, you need to listen to me about this tonight. It, Rome, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God will never put on you more than you're able to bear. Never do that. James, we just studied this. James, the first chapter in our study book of Sunday, James 1, 2 through 4 says, count it all joy when you've, fall into the muck and mire of trials. In other words, when you fall into quicksand of testing. In Luke, the first chapter, verse 37, the angel said to Mary, when he said, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. And she said, how is that possible? I'm a virgin. And you know what he said to her? Nothing's impossible with God. What are you talking about, honey? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about you have to do it for God. I'm talking about God's got to do it for you. See the difference in that? Quit going to that idea that I have to carry the bread. How can I carry that? You don't have to carry it at all, honey. I'm going to bring it to pass. That's when it becomes possible, not impossible. Everything is possible with God, you got to put yourself in a position to hear that and believe it. And listen, she just had, she just had, God had just given her a clear example of that when he gave, gave Elizabeth the baby in her old age, which it shouldn't have been, right? I mean, he gave her enough. Listen, this is when God begins to coach you. In, uh, here's one in Luke 18, 27, in the rich young ruler, in that co conversation with the rich young ruler you're familiar with, and he, he and, and people get all hung up on uh, the camel and the eye of a needle. You remember that? And they miss what he said about that. They miss. How many, you all know about the uh, camel and the eye of a needle, right? Do you know why he said it? You know, Jesus said that. Do you know why he said it? Nobody knows. They get all hung up on a camel trying to stick, 
push a camel through an eye of a needle. Then they come up with all kinds of other stories with it. He's trying to show you. Listen to this. Listen. The eye of a needle. Let me just let me just get it to you. Look at this. Luke 18. Just go to your Bible. Put your eyes on it. Luke 18. Because this is the eye of the camel deal. Luke 18. Better for you to put your eye on it. Put, put your eye on the needle there. And uh, is it verse 27? You know, verse 25, it's e easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they who heard it said, then who can be saved? And, and here's, the point of the, here's the point of the camel and the needle. The things impossible with men are possible with God. Listen, <laughs> you can't argue. He's not trying to get you to argue some kind of rational and pure idea here. He's trying to show you something that when you think that you're in an impossible situation and God has given you a word of possibility, take that possibility. Take the word. Take the word. What he was trying to show them that what's impossible with men is possible with God. Why? Through the word. What do I have to have? Faith in the word. Why? Romans 4.21. God is faithful to do what he's promised. That's why. There's nothing in your life that should get you to a place where it's impossible. I just don't say how to. What are you talking about? That's because you got your head stuck into the impossibilities of your life. Pull your head out of the sand. You know, put it in God. But there is one thing that God calls, says it's impossible. Yeah. Hebrews 11, 6. So let's put our eyes on it. So I can help you get your head out of the sand. I'm being kind, ain't I? Okay. 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. How about that? See, there's one, if you got your head in the impossibilities, you got to have faith to get it out, because God will pull your head out of it. You got to be willing to have that. This, this, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Just think how, but listen, nothing's impossible with God, except when you don't have faith. It's impossible for him to pull you out of the muck and the mire. I don't care if it's your job. I don't care if it's your family. I don't care if it's your wife. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's the doctor telling you. Bah, 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 bah. I don't know if anybody in the Bible had a tougher time than Jonah in the whale of the belly of the fish in the bottom of the ocean. I mean, that's, boy. I ain't never had a tough day compared to that. And in the second chapter, he prays this enormous prayer and <laughs> he spits them out. You know what that was? That's a God thing. That's what that was. Listen, God was willing for him not to even go on that whole trip. But since he did, <laughs> look, he got a free ride home. Didn't cost him anything to get back. Cost him everything to run from God. Didn't cost him anything to get home. Got a free ride. Got a boat trip home. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, without faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Why? Because it's not finished. You only, listen, only tell you're at the finish line. You take a deep sigh. 
in the meantime, I don't care if you walk, crawl, or whatever you do, you finish. You back up. If you can't get back up on your feet, get back, back up on your knees. Let's get through this thing. Or do the belly crawl. After 20 years of prayer, Isaac and Rebecca, after 20 years of prayer, God answered their prayer with twins. Be careful what you pray for. They just wanted a little cute baby. Preferably a male father. We can get this over in one shot. Right? <laughs> just give me one. Give me a healthy little boy. And we'll be on the road. He gives them two. He gives two boys. He gives twins. In the messianic seed of which only one can be. And so the test goes on. Now we're in, we're in the second zone. We've got, we've got babies, but we got conflict. We got conflict with the messianic seed promise. Because only one of the two can be. And how interesting does that go? Is necessary because only one of these twins can become the messianic seed. Like in Galatians 3.16. The messianic prophecy of twins is given in Genesis. So let's go to Genesis 25. And I'll, I'll show you my passage that I selected. I mean, it, there was a lot to choose from. I just chose this passage. 25. I'm actually looking for 23. But pay attention to, if you have a study Bible, this is about... Having the child starts in verse 19. Now, these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. That's Messianic seed stuff. Now, down in verse 23, here's the, here's the prophetic, there's the prophecy, the Messianic prophecy that's given with these two boys. And uh, given to them, well, they're struggling with inside her womb in verse 22. And so she goes and prays to the Lord, what is going on? I just wanted a messianic seed, and I've got a whole lot of movement. I'm having an elephant or something. <laughs> so I, something's going on. This is my first one, but this seems to be like a biggie. And the Lord answered her prayer. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. That's the prophecy. And let me tell you, that now that they have the child and they have their prophecy, there's going to be more conflict. They're in zone two. They're in zone two. And so I laid that out to you. Listen, and listen, out of these, out of these two boys, are going to come two great nations that are going to be in conflict and they still are in conflict, these two nations, the Edomites and the Israelites. Esau becomes the great nation of the Edomites and we're still fighting that war. They will become, the, these children, now we're in a family, these children will become the intensification target in the angelic conflict against the seed of Christ. Now it will heat up. It will heat up. In, in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 20, it says, by faith, Isaac, this, now this is the great Hebrew, you know, the faith thing. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding Things to come. Here's point five. Isaac and Rebecca, spiritual conflict of marriage and family will occur from zone two all the way to zone five. If you study the rest of their life, it's a mess. It doesn't have to be, but listen, we have that prophecy. That prophecy is going to roll out. 
And these boys, are, these two nations are going to be in conflict. These boys are going to be in conflict. They're two different people. When those, listen, when those two boys were, were, bor were born, you, there were never two kids that were so unlike that you couldn't believe they came from those parents. Do you understand? We got Esau over here was totally different than Jacob, and it was prophetic. They're going to be two different persons. And boy, were they ever. And here's the problem with it. They were told that you're going to have two unique kids, and they're going to be, they're going to be miles apart. They knew it going in, did they not? Was there not a heads up on it? And they mismanaged those two guys terribly. They mismanaged them terribly. They mismanaged them terribly. If you know any about the story, you ought to study it. In a flash, zone two, in a flash. Now, it took 20 years to get out of one. Now we're in two. And we go from two sons born in conflict that will be totally two different, totally people. In one verse, we go to where the kids, the two kids are 40 years old. Wouldn't that be something? Because in the 25th chapter and, and verse 27, that should be, I got, I, on my paper it says 25-2. It should be 25-7. In 25-27, it should be 25-27. It says, in one verse, in one verse it says, in one verse, we've gone all the way from birth to, you know, to, to small kids. We got two small kids. Now we're 40 years. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob became peaceful. And, and listen, it, uh, Isaac is, Esau is 40 years old. Esau and Jacob are 40 years old. One verse, we've gone from kids in that, you know, kids growing up and fussing and fighting. And boy, how did we get these two kids? They're so much, they are nothing alike. Well, that's what God said. In, in a flash, zone two passed in biblical time in the plan of God. Uh, that's 25, 27, one verse. What had occurred, watch this now, was separate parenting going on to these two kids. Separate parenting. Oh, I tell you, you're in a heap of trouble. Separate parenting. When kids know that they got that, they, they run the show. You can never have that. There has to be one unity of parenting. That child's got to know that mom and dad are on the same page. They got to know that. Otherwise, they're going to play like a fiddle. They've got to know that. They're healthy when they know that. They're unhealthy when they know that, that we, can, we got them. They can't, you can't ever let those kids do that. It's unhealthy for them. It, 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 it's a negative effect on their life. And there's a good example here. What happened when this occurred with these kids? Rebecca took Jacob and daddy took Esau because he was a man's man. He liked to fish and hunt and, and bring them home and cut them open and cook them up and eat them. It doesn't matter. They should have shared responsibilities with these kids. I see this happen so much and it's, it's destructive to children as it was with these. Rather than have a united front in raising kids with the word of God so that we could have a product of Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child parents in unity of the word of God and when they grow old, they'll not depart from it. Have that promise in your soul. 40 years passed 40 years pass, and Esau gets married. In Genesis 26, 34, Isaac is 100. We still got conflict going on. And when, when you pay attention to who Isaac married, it tells you the story. Well, Esau, I mean e Esau. When you see Esau get married, Esau got married when he was 40. When you see Esau get married, you can see the conflict in that home for 40 years because listen he marries a woman opposite of his mama 
He's going to be sure he doesn't marry no woman like his mama. Listen, most kids are like, listen, I was raised by my grandmama. You know who I look for when I dated girls? I look for somebody like my grandma. I looked for somebody like my grandmother. I wanted somebody that was nurturing, caring. I didn't look for who I could put on my arm to say, look who Ron's got. I looked for somebody that could carry the load with me down the pike like my grandmother. I looked for a woman like my grandma. I married a woman like my grandmother. And But listen, that's because of the influence of a person over your life. An enormous influence. I, I, that, that person that nurtured you in those early years has enormous influence. And the ones who pushed you away also have an enormous influence. He goes out and marries a woman that's absolutely nothing like his mother. He marries an unholy, ungodly unbeliever. And you know why he does it? Despite his mama. And boy, did it. Boy, did it ever. <coughs> Here's Esau's whole attitude in, in Genesis 27, 41. This is before Jacob leaves. This is after the whole mess in the family. This is how this whole thing blew up. He's getting married. I don't want anybody like my mama. The days of mourning for when the days of mourning for my, see, he's a hundred. I, Isaac is a hundred years old. And he's having some health issues. And he thinks he's about to die. All the kids thought he was going to die. <laughs> be, be, be careful what you wish for. They all thought he was going to die. And so he says, he says, and it, it was well known in the family and, and to the people who worked with him. As soon as he dies, I'm killing Jacob. How bad is that? I'm going to kill him. You know what? Listen to me. Isaac is going to live 80 more years. Just in case you think your doctor knows everything. Jacob lived another 80 years in zone five. Genesis 35, 28 and 29 tells you about his age and tells you what was on it. Epitaph. An old man of ripe age, which means satisfied with life. He finally got there. Satisfied with life and his sons Esau and Jacob had buried the sword and buried him. I don't know if that's a happy ending or not because the kid's still fighting. But I'm telling you, these zones are important in your life. Pay attention to them because you're headed to another zone. Everybody go through them unless you die early. Everybody goes through them. And, and God wants you to be prepared. The, you need to study the word of God. You always need to know what is going on, where you are and where you're going, because you're going somewhere in these zones. These zones are important. You don't have to go through them and, oh, woe was me and, and stick your head in the mud. Me. The Edomite, well, he would be the Arab coalition today, part of the Arab coalition. Yeah, the Edomites. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get out of here. I know, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. We've covered a whole lot of biblical territory about from Genesis 25 to 35. It would be well worth somebody to read and take time to go through it because our subject matter was looking at the five zones of life especially married life where it begins and then travels through it through the life of Isaac and Rebecca. We are not told when Rebecca died, which is kind of unusual for us as a patriarch wife. But this family started out spiritually wonderfully. Prayed to God for a child and God gave him two and then gave him instructions about him. And from that point on, they just pretty much ran their life the way they wanted. And what a mess. They quit studying the Bible together, quit praying together, quit doing the things together that were necessary to keep everything functional and operational and happy. I pray we would not be that couple. 
They could have turned, any zone can be turned around. Any zone, any zone can be turned around by the grace of God, by the power of God, through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It can be changed. It can be brought into places that one would never imagine possible. Because God is gracious. God is good. God, and he, and he, he, he works the love thing as, as magical as anybody I've ever known could do it in a life of people. I pray that over uh, this lesson for the people that have heard it or will hear it through the Internet. I pray this upon your life in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.